Mark, thanks for the, those words of introduction, um, especially the, the beep, beep, whoop, whoop. Uh, I'm really looking forward to a fire alarm now. Um, if someone at the back can fix that later, it'd be really good. Um, Ashley, thank you for your, your welcome here. Um, and Jenny, thank you for using the phrase a thirst for evidence in, in introducing a, a WASH conference. I can't think of anything much more, more appropriate. It was only when... Um, I came to start to prepare this presentation that I realized that I hadn't really paid enough attention to the title I'd been given. And I say that because, in actual fact, it's quite difficult to talk about WASH and health. Because what most of us worry about, what most of us think about, talk about, is really WASH and disease. And the two aren't the same. Certainly, when Ashley referred to, reminded us of our ancestors a moment ago. It reminded me of my own family history in which WASH-related disease figured quite prominently. During the European Industrial Revolution, my ancestors lived in what we would now call peri-urban slums, when life expectancy for labourers like them was somewhere between 15 and 19 years. A few of them lived to a ripe old age, and thanks to them, I'm here. Um, but in doing so, they watch many of their children die. So those life expectancy figures reflect an averaging of child mortality with the lifespans of the survivors, just the same as they do today. Barbara, I think it was you that I heard at a conference a little while ago. You look really worried. You don't need to. <laughs> Reminding us that the average child today is more likely to survive their birth, more likely to attend school, more likely to reach adulthood, more likely to survive giving birth, and more likely to die of old age. <laughs> and that's reflected in the fact that in my lifetime, life expectancy in the, developing nation, in the developing nations has increased by 20 years. And in part, that's because of what amounts to very dramatic advances in WASH. We know, looking back in history, that the introduction of very basic sanitary measures brought diseases like cholera and typhoid, which had extraordinarily high mortality rates under control in the countries of what we now refer to as, as the developed world. And diarrheal disease continues to dominate discussions about wash and health because of its contribution to the global burden of disease, because of its impact, especially on children, and because of the evidence that wash can be very effective in reducing them. So we should be encouraged to see that in recent decades there have been disproportionate reductions in diseases like diarrhoea. On this figure, that's the, the pale yellow, second from the bottom, that have been historically major contributors to the global burden of disease. And if, we, if we then drill down into those, we see that there have been very, very variable estimates of the global burden of WASH-related disease. And if we focus for a moment just on the diarrheal disease component of that, they range between 300,000 and 2.2 million deaths every year. Why? Well, clearly some of the difference is because the background levels of diarrheal disease are declining over time. So we would expect to see a difference. Some of it is due to differences in the methods that different researchers have, have taken, especially what they refer to as the counterfactual, the gold standard. Where do we have to reach to get the best, the best health that is reasonably achievable? <laughs> so, for example, when Annette Proust did her work, that's the, the earlier studies, or includes the er earlier studies, she said, well, what if we could get everyone to the circumstance where the developed world is today? And she based her estimates on that. Contrast that with, with the more recent estimate from Lim, for example, who went to the opposite extreme and said, hey, we're not accounting for any health improvement once people have got a latrine and access to a community water, water source. And some of the disagreement relates to the impact we expect from any given WASH intervention. And that's important because all of these estimates are about preventability. They're not about attribution of disease. So they rely on studies that have evaluated the degree of reduction in morbidity and mortality associated with WASH interventions. And the truth is that we have few studies, perhaps 100, and fewer high-quality studies 
with which we try and describe the whole global impact of a huge range of different transmission pathways. <laughs> the things that make high-quality studies, high-quality in the terms of, of the health profession, difficult in the world of WASH, are many. We expect to be able to blind uh, study subjects so that the recipients and the researchers are not biased by knowing whether something's being done. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but I find it quite difficult to imagine that I wouldn't know if I'd washed my hands. It doesn't work, does it? Health researchers rely on randomization of interventions, and yet deciding to give an intervention to certain people and not to others is extraordinarily difficult in the world of WASH. How would we do that if we're installing piped water systems? One house gets it, another doesn't. They're concerned about compliance, whether people do what they're supposed to do. Now, as I look around this room, I'm sure that we're all fairly mischievous at times. We don't do what we're supposed to do. It's very difficult to assess whether people comply with a health intervention. And we've seen in the case of household water treatment and safe storage, for example, very low rates of sustained behaviour change over time. And it's very difficult to distinguish individual effects from community effects. The impact of my toilet on my health as opposed to the impact of my neighbour's toilets on my health. And as well as those factors, there are challenges in actually, as well as those challenges in undertaking study as well, there's also likely to be a great deal of variability in the actual impact of interventions because the principal transmission routes will vary from one place to another. Now, I've focused as I begin on diarrheal disease. And while we tend to do so in the world of WASH, these burden of disease studies to treat WASH much more comprehensively. They look at it as a medium that can transmit pathogens and toxic chemicals, causing diarrhea, fluorosis, arsenicosis through ingestion, causing legionellosis through inhalation. They treat WASH as a set of services that contribute to disease prevention, water for personal hygiene, relevant for trachoma, scabies, as well as diarrhea. Sanitation services relevant to diarrhea, schistosomiasis, intestinal parasites. They treat WASH as a set of behaviours, personal and household hygiene. Water collection relevant to schistosomiasis, relevant to physical injury from the act of carrying water. And ecosystems, irrigation management relevant to schistosomiasis. Agricultural hygiene relevant to Japanese encephalitis. And the associated diseases have been dealt with differently in different estimates. Some of them are very large in global burden of disease terms. Malaria, drowning, malnutrition. Many of the others, we don't even have global burden of disease estimates, let alone insight into the proportion that could be prevented through better management of hygiene, sanitation and water. What's more, it's long been reported that the impacts of interventions are considerably greater than we would expect based on adding up these individual disease outcomes. That used to be known as the mills reinecke phenomenon because it was first described by researchers more than 100 years ago. More recently, in, if we look at the estimate that was put together by... An, oops, we've gone too many ahead. Let me jump back. There we are. Um, if we look at the estimate put together by Annette Proust in 2008, she included not only the impact of, diarrhea, of wash on diarrhoea, but also the impact of that diarrhoea on malnutrition. And then she asked the question, well, what's the impact of that bit of malnutrition that's caused by wash or the lack of wash on other disease outcomes? And that dominated their burden of disease estimate. Now, it seems to me that there are three clear components of what may appear to be a rather complex wash and health story. The interactions are, are many and they are complex. But improving wash has substantive impacts on disease prevention. And at the same time, wash has progressed massively in recent years. Now, we're fortunate in the world of WASH to have solid information on progress thanks to WHO and UNICEF. 
and they produce figures such as these. But when we look at these kinds of presentations, we sometimes overlook the enormity of what's actually been achieved. In just 20 years, the number of people with water on our planet increased from 4 billion people to 6 billion people, 50% increase. The increase for sanitation is even greater. It was 70%. And if we look in regions like sub-Saharan Africa, both of those figures have doubled. Now, with such a powerful set of health interventions and such a track record of progress, it strikes me it's a real irony that of all people, wash people tend to see a glass that's half empty and not one that's half full. Jenny, this is back to your thirst for evidence, I think. I hear laments that WASH is going down the disease burden rankings. Terrible. People craving for a good, decent disease outbreak to move WASH back up the health agenda. We can't have it both ways. If WASH is advancing and if it's preventing disease, then the disease burden will be declining. And what's worse, the better we do, the faster that's going to happen. And this progress means that the remaining disease burden is concentrated on those most disadvantaged. So first priority is reaching to those without basic services. The health impact of failing to do so, we can see at all levels. Here is just one global depiction where you see the disproportionate contribution from diarrheal disease of two regions, sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And that means that getting the most disease reduction out of WASH resembles the title of this conference, Everyone, Everywhere. And in doing so, it reflects fundamental principles of both public health and of human rights. But to, today, a growing majority of us have some water and san sanitation. So the, the remainder, the remainder who carry the disease burden, are increasingly unserved for specific reasons. They're individuals within households. One in six people on our planet, a billion of us, are disabled in some way or another. For some, toilet access is a matter of not only health but also di dignity. There are households within communities who may be unable to access community facilities because of caste restrictions or lack of economic means with the associated health benefits. And here you see the extreme differences in South Asia between upper quintile and lower, lower quintile income households. Entire communities may be disadvantaged, whether by enduring racial disparities, as nomadic populations in the Sahel, because the world's 370 million indigenous people are disproportionately represented among the unserved and among those with the worst health conditions. And some entire countries or regions may be disadvantaged, for example, because they are perceived to be ineffective users of, of aid. And here we see some of the examples of the countries which are, not, which, are, which are not targeted to benefit from aid, despite the severity of their wash situation. But all of that thinking, in the end, is driven by the idea that we use and we manage sanitation and water at home. And our conference title reminds us that in actual fact, we need wash everywhere. And that means places that we all use at different times in our lives, schools, workplaces. It means places we pass through, like markets and transport hubs. It means places where people are dependent on others, like detention facilities and prisons. And it means places where health is especially vulnerable, such as healthcare settings. We know remarkably little about wash and health in those places. But we do know that in schools and healthcare, it's certainly no better than and maybe worse than the conditions in the surrounding community. Now, in recognising just how much has been achieved, it's easy for us to understate how much re remains to be done. And it's easy to do so if we adopt low benchmarks. This is like the health investigators and their counterfactuals. WHO and UNICEF's headline data refer to collecting water from, an from a protected source, which may be 
more, or it can be more than half an hour from home. But if we shift our benchmark to water in the house or in the yard, then in fact 16 rather than 61% of the population of sub-Saharan Africa would have access. And that matters for health because as water becomes more readily available at home, so that it's more used for key hygiene behaviours and there's less likelihood of musculoskeletal impacts associated with carrying water. The same applies to water safety. We should be really proud that 90% of the global population used an improved water cell source. But if we account for, the, for whether the water is actually free of faecal contamination and the source is basically protected, then barely half of us get water from a safe source. And we see the same pattern if we turn to sanitation. Counting toilets has helped us. It's been a really useful tool. But more than half of the households that are connected to a sewer in low- and middle-income countries flush their waste untreated back into the human environment, where it causes disease through drinking water, foodstuffs, direct contact. We increasingly recognise that sanitation and water services are not reliable, and we see that in, in statistics on functionality, on continuity and sustain, sustainability. And sometimes we lose sight of the fact that the health benefits of WASH can be lost very readily. Using raw water for just two days increases the annual probability of, in this case, E. coli infection from less than 1% to 24%. So these interruptions that in WASH terms may appear modest, in health terms, may have very large consequences. Oops. Now, overall, we're moving from a world that's dominated by a, a lack of wash with a need to enhance access to improve health towards one in which most people have something, but they're at risk of losing it. And that implies to me a change in our vocabulary towards a need for wa wash security, for health security. Brisbane's a, a great city. I love being here. I hope everybody else does as well. That's, yeah. But if you took away its sanitation and water systems, it would be a shitty, unhealthy place. So does it score low on the wash and disease scale or high on the wash and health scale? If we take a risk perspective, it highlights the dangers of underinvesting in infrastructure, in maintaining infrastructure. We see that in data on hand pump lifespan in sub-Saharan Africa, and across the world, in the United States, the American Society for Civil Engineers gives what the U.S.'s water and wastewater infrastructure a degrade year in, year out, because that country is also investing too little and leaving under unpaid bills stacking up for the next generation. And a risk perspective also calls attention to the threats that we're responding to, to, to poorly and things that are changing, that are going to challenge us in the future. Sanitation and water systems are vulnerable to climate extremes. And yet I can tell you that when we reviewed the WASH program of a major implementing agency, we found that their programming in some countries was vulnerable and that there were options for adaptation. The response we got was essentially, please don't rock the boat. Our implementation is going just fine. Thank you. That stacks... Well, that was good, wasn't it? <laughs> That's stacking more problems for the future. Another example of threats includes the fact that most of our emerging diseases are zoonoses from animal reservoirs. And water connects us, connects us to large, ever-increasing animal populations that are kept increasingly close to human settlements. And these challenges interact with one another. So we see, for example, human leptospirosis associated with both rodent populations and with flooding. So we need to plan better for, towards the future. I began by saying it's easier to talk about wash and disease than it is to speak about wash and health. The wash and disease story seems to have three actually remarkably simple components. The first, it's complicated. The interactions are many and complex. Second, well, improving WASH really does 
improve disease prevention dramatically. And the third, that WASH has progressed absolutely massively in recent decades, reducing disease as it went. Now, that progress means that we are confronted by the old challenges of enabling access, especially to disadvantaged groups, and of upgrading services for those that have something, but also increasingly the need to reflect the WASH and health story by adopting a risk perspective to protect those achievements. We need to move our story and we need to move the metrics that we use away from the bad news of WASH and disease and onto the good news of WASH as a really valuable preventive health investment. And we need to do that if we're going to convey its importance in the future as we slip down those rankings because we're not causing ill health. Finally, hygiene. So often the poor sister of sanitation and water has figured far too little on what I've said here today. We really need the evidence to back up the advocacy around hygiene and to inform effective actions. One final thought. My university, UNC, has got a piece of wash infrastructure, the old well, as its official symbol. Nowadays, it's uh, a stunning photographic backdrop. Our students go there and they have a drink. I, I hasten to add a drink of water for good luck when they join the university. For many years, it was where the inhabitants of student residences collected their water from everything, for everything, from drinking to washing. And yes, they had outbreaks of typhoid. And yes, the inadequate latrines were found to be at fault. 1923, many years after the well had been converted to that rather pretty form that you see today, there was a survey of tenant farmers in North Carolina. 1923, none of them had running water, and eight of 175 had outside privies. Now, just in case anyone's in any doubt, the others didn't have inside privies. This is open defecation, yes? That's roughly the situation in rural Somalia today. So in much less than 100 years, WASH helped transform the health of that state. We don't need another century for everyone to enjoy good water, sanitation and hygiene. Everywhere. Always. The better we test, learn, apply lessons and adapt to the changing circumstances, the sooner we can all enjoy longer, more productive and healthier lives. Thank you.